by saying that he hadn't recorded everything that Jesus had said and done or even the miracles that he'd performed, but these things had been recorded so that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And so you get this impression that Jesus did a whole lot more than what we have written for us in the Word of God, but what was necessary was given to us. And I think about that when I read the Old Testament. I'm sure that we don't have everything that happened to the nation of Israel. Like we don't have every day recorded, obviously. But we have, if you like, the highlights. And uh, sometimes when we're at the, at the cinema, you'll get the highlights before the movie you've gone to see. You'll get the highlights of what's coming. And you sort of get a, a glimpse. And uh, some of you would know that uh, it's a particular passion of mine that when I'm reading the Old Testament, to look for glimpses of what's coming, to look for glimpses of the New Testament in the Old Testament. And I, I call them glimpses of grace. I call them glimpses of grace. You see, I believe that what we have in the Old Testament is in a large way preparing us for the coming of Christ, for, for what God was going to do through Jesus Christ in overflowing our world with His grace. And so I expect to find glimpses of that in the Old Testament as I read through it. And you know, when you go to the Old Testament with that expectation, if you can leave for a moment the law, the darkness, the sin, the rebellion, the punishment, the death, which is all in the Old Testament, if you can just push that for a moment behind you and start to allow it to open up glimpses of grace, it's amazing what you find in there. And the passage I'm about to read is one of those glimpses. And I preached at our Lakes campus a couple of weeks ago and I thought rather than just give them something that I've already preached here, I might give them the new thing and give you the repeat of it here. And so I said to the Lakes campus, you're like my guinea pigs this morning and if you're unresponsive, I know that I will not preach this at our, on my own campus at Springfield, but if you're really responsive, it gives me encouragement to do that. So I'm hoping that you can be as responsive in your receiving of this as, uh, as the Lakes campus where it was, a, it was a great morning. Glimpses of grace. They remind me of an astronomical term called a diamond ring. Uh, astronomers call a diamond ring that moment when the moon is passing between the earth and the sun. It's an eclipse. I forget whether it's a solar or a lunar, it's one of the two, but there's an eclipse where the sun is darkened. And, and if you've ever seen an eclipse like that, there's like a if you've ever seen it on TV, you can't look at it, obviously, but there's like this dark sphere and there's just this glow around the outside as the sun completely, if you like, obliterates the light, as the moon, rather, completely obliterates the light from the sun. But as the moon continues in its path, there's a flash of light that comes off the orb and it just comes off in one spot. And I've got a, a picture of it there. Obviously, it's called a diamond ring for obvious reasons. And these glimpses of grace that I find in the, in, the, in the darkness, if you like, of the Old Testament uh, is like this flash of light that you get. And it's just there for a moment. It's just there for a particular account. But it reminds you again, Jesus Christ is coming. And he will be, his light will be fully revealed. And uh, we've, we've got a day yet to come when it says that the light of Christ will flash from one end of the heavens to the other and all the earth will see his glory. That will be an amazing time. So I'm going to read from Esther, Esther chapter 4, and I'm going to read some verses there from verse 10 to chapter 5, verse 2, and then give us a bit of, if you're not familiar with the story, give us a bit of background on where this takes place. So it sort of picks up the story halfway through. Don't worry, I will give you some background, and then we're going to look at how this is a glimpse of grace for us. Esther chapter 4 from verse 10. And I'm reading from the message version that should be up on the screen. Esther talked it over with Hatch and then sent him back to Mordecai with this message. Everyone who works for the king here and even the people out in the provinces knows that there is a single fate for every man or woman who approaches the king without being invited. Death. The one exception is if the king extends his gold scepter, then he or she may live. And it's been 30 days now since I've been invited to come to the king. When Hadach told Mordecai what Esther had said, Mordecai sent her this message. Don't think that just because you live in the king's house, you're the one Jew who will get out of this alive. If you persist in staying silent at a time like this, 
help and deliverance will arrive for the Jews from someplace else. But you and your family will be wiped out. Who knows? Maybe you were made queen for just such a time as this. Esther sent back her answer to Mordecai. Go and get all the Jews living in Susa together. Fast for me. Don't eat or drink for three days, either day or night. I and my maids will fast with you. If you will do this, I'll go to the king, even though it's forbidden. And if I die, I die. Mordecai left and carried out Esther's instructions. Three days later, Esther dressed in her royal robes and took up a position in the inner court in the palace in front of the king's throne room. The king was on his throne facing the entrance. When he noticed Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased to see her. The king extended the gold scepter in his hand. Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. The events in the book of Esther occur when God's people Israel are in exile. They're in exile as a result of their own sin and rebellion and they're going after other gods rather than the one true God. They'd left a homeland, they'd left their culture, they'd left their temple. Everything in this new land was foreign to them. They were aliens in a foreign country and events have transpired in Susa, the winter capital of Persia where they're in exile, that have brought a young Jewish woman, Esther, to the throne of Persia as queen. Her nationality at this point is a secret. One of the king's trusted advisors, Haman, has become offended with Esther's cousin and guardian, Mordecai, because he has refused to honor a Haman by bowing down to him. And Haman has let the offense eat away at him to such a point where he wants blood, and he doesn't just want Mordecai's blood, he wants the blood of every Jew living in Persia. And so he concocts this plan, and if you like, in some ways, tricks the king into authorizing a plan that every Jew should be wiped out in the realm of Persia on one specific day. Mordecai knows that their only hope is some sort of intervention, and so he requests that Esther speak up for the Jews with the king. Interestingly, although Esther is one of only two books in the Bible that actually don't mention God at all, it's very evident that Mordecai has a faith in this God because he says to Esther, if you won't do it, don't worry, God's people will be saved. He has a faith and it's evident in there. In fact, you can see the fingerprint of God right throughout the book of Esther. Esther understood that if she approached the king without an invitation, she was taking her life into her own hands. Even as queen, she was still under the law. In fact, the laws of the Persians and the Medes were so highly held that even the king himself was not above them. And so we find a little later in the book that when the king issues this edict that all the Jews should be wiped out in one day, and he has second thoughts about that, he can't revoke the, the ruling that he's already made. The best he can do is offer the Jews a chance of self-defense, that they can attack their enemies on the same day. So the law was this. Come uninvited into the presence of the king, and there was one punishment death. That was the law. The only way to be spared from death while coming into the presence of the king uninvited is if he held his scepter out to you. The scepter was the legally recognized instrument by which a king could show mercy while yet upholding the law. So when the king held out the scepter to Esther, it was a sign of his pleasure in her it was a sign of his acceptance for her, and it was also it was a sign of his mercy over her. I won't go in to tell you what happened. You can read that for yourself in the book of Esther. If, uh, if you're not familiar, you can do that at home. But what I want you to do, or what I want us to do, is look more closely at this morning, at this glimpse of grace that happens in the courts of the king of Persia when a young Jewish woman is spared from the punishment of death some 470 years before the birth of Jesus. And I want us to take that event and I want us to bring it through the cross of Christ into 2016 right here in Springfield in our church. And what does that mean to us? What does this thing mean to us that happened two and a half thousand years ago? And I wanted to, in doing that, answer three questions for us. And they're all about the presence of God. 
First is, how do we come into the presence of God? The second one is, in what way do we come into the presence of God? And lastly, why? Why do we come into the presence of God? If I was to picture a scripture that adequately reflected the difference that grace has made to contrast with what happened with Esther in the king of in the court of the king of Persia if we take that and we bring it through the cross if I was to pick a scripture that that sort of shows you the difference the cross of Christ makes in a situation I'd have to go to this one from Hebrews chapter 4 Hebrews 4:14 4, to 16 it says there so then since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly. Let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. That's an incredible contrast, isn't it? We don't have to come timidly. We don't have to come fearfully. We don't have to come uh, because we've done something wrong. We don't know what the outcome will be when we face God and his presence on the throne. We don't have to come that way. The Bible talks about an audacious grace, one that we can come before our king, our God, boldly. When she was approached, when Esther rather approached the throne, she was unsure whether a sword would take off her head or whether a scepter would be held out in mercy. And when we approach the throne, though, we know that there is no law that can take us down. There's no law that can be held against us. Even the devil himself, the Bible calls the accuser of the brethren, is silenced in the court of God for the son or daughter of God as they enter. You see, because we've been held, if you like, the scepter of mercy. Are you seeing the similarities between Esther's story and our own? You see, Jesus is actually called the scepter of God. Thousands of years before the birth of Christ, in Numbers 24, 17, by a pagan, mind you, he prophesies this. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. What saved Esther and what saves us from the law and certain death was and is the scepter of the king. So the first question, how do we come into the presence of God? The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The law of God demands complete and perfect obedience. The problem with that is that we're all infected with sin and we have been from birth. God couldn't ignore the law, a law that demanded perfect obedience... He couldn't ignore it. It demanded death to the sinner and that punishment could not be changed. We were born condemned because of sin. We could not come into the presence of a holy God with the stench of sin still on us. Like Esther, the law was against us, and like the king in the story of Esther, God could not ignore the law. The only way that God could both uphold the law and spare us from death was to die in our place. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He took our sins upon himself and then he took the punishment for those sins to the cross. He died in your and my place so that we could be forgiven. And God raised him to life again so that we with him could live eternally. How do we come into the presence of God? Only, only by Jesus, the Son of God and the scepter of God. Without him results in death. With him results in open access to God. Let me get some myths out of the way. 
just in case you were wondering whether there was some other option. Good works won't save you from death. The Bible says that even the best you can do, even the best selfless thing that you could do is like filthy rags before God. This is not a myth. The faith of your parents can't save you. It has to be your heart that believes and has to be your mouth that confesses, the Bible says. Relying on the decision you made for Jesus in the past while showing no signs of change that that decision should be bringing won't save you from death. You need to prove your faith by what you do, the Bible says. And being religious won't save you from death. God can't stomach lukewarm Christianity that just goes through the motions. The Bible says. This is not me. This is what the Bible says. And some of these things perhaps that we rely on even from time to time are nothing more than shifting sand. Although this account of Esther happened some 2,500 years ago, time has done nothing to change our circumstances. Some people have the impression that the God of the Old Testament, who carries out what he carries out, as he carries it out, is, is different from the God of the New Testament. See, in, in the God of the New Testament, he's the God of love and the God of mercy and, 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 the, and the God that, that comes close. That, that, that's not the God I read about in the Old Testament. The, the, the thing is, they're the same God. God is changeless. He hasn't changed. He's always been the same. The God that we find in the New Testament, he was in the Old Testament. What changes is Jesus. Some people say that time heals. Time doesn't heal anything. Time just passes. Time just passes. What has changed is the coming of Jesus Christ into our world. He that was outside of time broke into our time and space and made a way that we could come into the throne room of God with audaciousness, with boldness, with confidence. Jesus and Jesus alone is the only access to the throne of God. He's offered to you just as the scepter was held out to Esther. But you need to notice something in this story of Esther. It wasn't enough that the scepter was held out to Esther. She also approached and touched it. And in touching it, she accepted the acceptance of the king. She accepted the pleasure of the king. She accepted the mercy of the king. There was something required on Esther's part to accept what was being held out to her. And the same is true for us. God holds his son Jesus and said he is the only way. No religiousness, no good works, no faith of parents is good enough. What is good enough is my perfect son who perfectly obeyed the law and now is ready and willing to take your sin upon himself and to offer you forgiveness so that you have a clean slate before God today and for the rest of your life. I know that many of you in this campus this morning have made a decision, made that decision, accepted God's offer of mercy in Jesus Christ. If that's you this morning, if at one point in your life... See, normally when we have a, a call for people to accept Jesus Christ, normally we ask those who want to accept him for the first time to raise their hand or to stand up. Not this morning. This morning what I'd like you to do is if you've accepted Jesus Christ at some point in your life, I'd like you to stand. Just close your eyes across the auditorium. Every eye closed. Now this morning, while everyone is standing, if this is the first time you've accepted God's offer of Jesus Christ and you want to say, John, that's me this morning. I want to, I, I want to have that freedom to enter into God's presence. I'm understanding that Jesus is the only way. If that's you this morning, while we're all standing, would you raise your hand? Anyone here this morning? Thank you. 
Any others this morning? Any others this morning saying, this morning, John, I'm accepting Jesus Christ and his forgiveness for my sin. Thank you. Any others this morning? Church, let's just pray right now. Let's pray together. Dear God, God, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Christ. And I believe today today that he is the only way of salvation. salvation. I believe that in Jesus, I I have complete forgiveness forgiveness of all of my sins, sins. that I am loved by you, that I I have your mercy upon me, and I can come into your presence presence with all boldness. Thank you, God, for what you've done for me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Why don't you take your seats? Praise the Lord. That's how we come into the presence of God. In in what way? In what way do we come into the presence of God? Well, Hebrews 4 tells us that we come into his presence with boldness and with confidence. And uh, I was reminded on the men's weekend, this is my testimony, get your chin up. Get your chin up. And it wasn't even Andrew that said it, it was, I think it was Martin Ben actually from our Lakes campus. You're a son, get your chin up. You're a daughter, get your chin up. Now I understand the necessity and, uh, and and the appropriateness of bowing before God. I understand that and I teach our RI kids Hold your hands, close your eyes, bow your heads, and I tell them the reasons why we do all those things. But, you know, sometimes we're so bowed in our posture before God that we're not, we're not exercising the boldness and the confidence that we can have when we come into the presence of one who loves us completely, who accepts us completely, and is interested in the, our very welfare of what's going on in our lives. We come to a loving father, not just a king on a throne. I grew up knowing the authority of God, but not understanding the love of God. And I've shared my story a few times. If you've heard it before, my apologies. But I, I, I think for an illustration of what I'm talking about, it's appropriate this morning. And because I grew up knowing the authority of God, but not the love of God so much, I, um, if you like, superimposed that on my relationship with my own father. Don't get me wrong, my father loved me. And, uh, and I can look back and, and see times now. But I think growing up, I had a real knowledge of his authority. He was a strict dad, and I appreciate that now too, uh, looking back. But I really didn't have, as a, as, a, as a teenager particularly, have an understanding of my dad's love for me. And so I, I forget what age I was. Maybe I was around 12 or something. And my habit was, before going to bed, I would, I would kiss my mum and my dad goodnight. And, and off I'd go to bed. But I remember at a certain age that I felt it was now inappropriate, I was much more mature, it was now inappropriate that I should kiss my dad goodnight. And so in my thinking, it, it, it seemed more appropriate to me that I, could just, I should just kiss my mum goodnight but shake hands with my dad goodnight. I, I don't know what my dad thought about that. Um, and, and, you know... I've come to a place now where I regret that decision. And my son, Tim, he's living in a different place, so he doesn't kiss me goodnight. But when we see one another, we hug and we kiss. And I love that about Tim's 26. 26? Yeah, 26. Almost. Almost 26. (laughs) But I I love that about him. You see, but that reflection that I placed on my own father, the handshake... Uh, because it was superimposed from my understanding of God, God had to catch up with me years later and, and bring some correction to me about that. And so I, I wasn't even thinking about this, but he just brought it to my heart and my mind, this, this decision that I'd made, I'd forgotten all about it, this decision that I'd made as a teenager, a young teenager, just to shake hands with my dad goodnight, and then God spoke into my heart and he says, and that's the way you treat me. I'm the God at arm's length for you, John. This is the sort of God I am for you. There's, there's a touch there, but there's still distance. You have to get up for a minute and stop hugging your wife. <laughs> and, and God was saying to me, this is the God I am, John. This is the God I am. I'll give you a kiss. 
two. There you go. It was a revelation to me that, that, and you know, sometimes I still find myself slipping back into the handshake relationship I have with, I don't know whether it's like that for you too, but you slip back into old patterns of things sometimes, not that you mean to, but it's almost like you've got to be intentional about this boldness and this confidence and this closeness that we now have with God as sons and daughters, because there's a culture out there that is putting distance between people, and if we let, allow that to superimpose on our relationship with God, then that's exactly what will happen there too. Not that God is putting distance between us, but we sort of back away a little bit, and there's no need to. There's no need, even in the worst of our days, even when we become such a failure in our own eyes and maybe in the eyes of others, God is still there wanting to embrace us because you're his son and you're his daughter. You're not perfect, hello, but Jesus is, and because you carry him around in you and his name on you, you are perfect before the eyes of a loving God. There is nothing to be afraid of about death or anything else when you're a Christian because you will be received with the embrace. You will be received with the embrace. When Hebrews tells us that we can approach the throne of grace with confidence, what does that look like? Well, it doesn't look like approaching God timidly, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, the Bible says. It doesn't mean a formal handshake either. It doesn't mean coming to Him as the last resort because... Well, maybe he might be interested in my problems. He's completely interested in your problems. Let me tell you the, 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 the picture, if you like, behind this verse in Hebrews. You know what the picture is, this coming with boldness and confidence? The picture is of a child that's been hurt running to its mother or father. I, I don't, as parents, some of you aren't parents, some of you might remember this, though, when you were children. When you got hurt as a child... Did who mum and dad was talking to at the time make any amount of difference at all? If you're hurt, you came running to them, crying, screaming, and we learned with our kids that the longer the breath between the screams, the more hurt they were. And so we just waited for the, let's just see if they're really hurt, let's see how long that pause is. They come running to you and they wrap themselves around your leg, mummy, I'm hurt. And they could care less what you're doing, who you're talking to. They could care less. That's the picture of boldness and confidence coming before God. God is not interested in something else when you're coming before him and needing mercy. He is completely engrossed in you. And he can do it for everyone at the same time. That's the amazing ability of Almighty God. That you have his complete attention. We need to remind ourselves of that. That's the confidence that Hebrews is talking about. It's knowing that there is no one I need more right now than my heavenly Father. That he will never be too preoccupied to ignore me when I need him. And I can run right up to him without hesitation. Esther, up until the moment the scepter was held out to her, was not sure whether she would live or die when she came into the presence of the king. But for us who have accepted God's answer to sin, Jesus, there is no question about what reception we'll receive when we come into the presence of God. It's complete and it's welcome and it's open-armed and it's couldn't wait to see you. I'm so glad you're here. That's the, that's the response of God to his sons and daughters. But you know, Esther also teaches us an important question about why. Why we come into the presence of God. Hebrews tells us that it's to receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. But grace and mercy for whom? I know that we need it. I know that we need it. But haven't we already received in Jesus Christ grace upon grace? Doesn't the Bible tell us that for the people of God, his mercies are new every morning? So yes, we do need to have grace and mercy, and there are many reasons that you can come before the presence of God, but Esther teaches us a very important reason for coming into the presence of God. The presence of God is something to come into with boldness, with anticipation, with confidence, but never more so than when you're coming into his presence on behalf of others. If Esther had not intervened, the salvation of the Jews would have occurred some other way. Mordecai said so. 
But the opportunity was with Esther to speak up in the presence of the king on behalf of her people. It was not without its dangers for Esther. Apart from the threat to her own life, her own identity was about to become open knowledge. Up until that time, the fact that she was a Jew was a secret. Esther was not in the throne room for her own benefit. She was in there for the benefit of those who were still under the sentence of death. And we should celebrate the grace and the mercy that we've received in Jesus Christ. But what about the billions out there who are still under sentence of death? Actually, what about the one out there who's still under the sentence of death? The one family member, the one neighbour, the one friend, the one colleague. You, like Esther, may be their only chance. And you have open access into the throne room of the one that can make life-changing difference in their life. You know, I've heard so many testimonies from people who have found salvation from their sins in Jesus Christ who came out of completely non-Christian backgrounds and you think, how did that happen? And you ask them the question, inevitably, it will come boil down to a couple of things. Someone shared the gospel with them and someone had been praying for them. Some auntie, some grandmother, who knows who, but someone was there that they now realise had been praying for them all along. Yesterday, uh, Andrew Stone brought along a friend with him, David, and uh, David now is um, uh, in, in full relationship with God, but for a time there in his late teens, he was totally away from God, and, and I asked him the question, I said, what made the difference? What, what brought you back, you know? And he said, I had a praying mother. That was... I had a praying mother and she prayed every day for me. That was the only thing he knew that brought him back from where he was. What happens when you're investing prayer into the one in your life who needs Jesus and you do it consistently? You start looking for the hand of God at work in their lives and you will see that there are opportunities that you can reveal that you're a son or daughter of the king. And you take advantage of those opportunities. In finishing the message this morning, I want us to do something. Just where you are, where you're seated. Just get into groups, twos, threes, fours, if you like. Not too big, though. And I'm sensing that the Holy Spirit, you already have someone on your heart. I believe that you do. That maybe you've prayed for for so long and and, and maybe you haven't prayed for them for a while. Or maybe there's someone brand new that's come into your life and, and maybe someone at work or a neighbor or someone in your street and... This is now a person that you can pray for because they, they also need this mercy of God in Jesus Christ over their lives. Maybe there's someone that you've consistently prayed for every single day. Well, today's an opportunity to pray again for them. So just where you are, two, threes or fours, begin to pray with one another and, 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 and get some agreement on the people that you're praying for. Get some agreement together for their salvation in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you that uh, today we turned a school auditorium into your throne room. Thank you that today we've come into your presence and we've brought, Lord God, not our needs, but the needs of those that we love, the needs of those in our lives. And you know they need more than we do. You love them more than we do. And yet you call us into prayer for them. You're asking for people to stand in the gap. And Father, we've done that this morning and I pray that we'll continue to do it. And we would see, Lord God, you move because only you can send out the messengers, Lord God. Only you can send out the word that these people can be saved. And we pray, Lord God, that you would give opportunity for the gospel to be preached. We pray, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit would so work in the hearts of those who are unsaved that their eyes would be opened and their ears open to see and to hear the good news that Jesus Christ is their salvation. And we pray, Lord God, that we would see many, that there would be many testimonies, Lord God, of your grace as we see people coming into the kingdom as we have prayed for them, Lord God, and shared our identity with them. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.